<laughs> hey, and welcome to the newest session of Academic Crisis Line. I'm very excited today because I have a lot of uh, very interesting guests who are going to talk today. Um, we're going to talk about gender bias in academia and how this is a problem for both men and women and um, how we both can navigate the situation and hopefully change it for the better in the future. Um, as usual, this is live. You can ask questions throughout the entire session. Just make sure, um, or just keep in mind that we have a slight delay between the recording and the broadcasting. So uh, ask your questions right away and don't wait too long because we might in real time have already moved on to the next topic. You can ask questions either by using um, the uh, the live chat on the right screen of the YouTube video, video window, or uh, you can tweet to me at, at ph under, uh, underscore dial. Um, you can also ask me ask email, uh, via email. Um, this is a bit slower and longer, and I can't promise that we can cover it during the live session, but I will reply to you. Um, and for more information about this series um, and past sessions, you can go to my website, storiesinthebrain.com, um, and there you find more information about the academic crisis line. So now let's, let me introduce you to the speakers of today. Um, next to me is uh, Yoed Kenneth, um, who is a postdoc here at Penn, um, a young academic father struggling with being a parent in science. and. Um, <laughs> I'm really happy that we also have him on board to have the male perspective on the topic. Um, uh, next, um, can one of Atsuko, can you make some noise so that we can see you? Hello, <laughs> I'm Atsuko. Hey, Atsuko is. Atsuko is a senior researcher at the Donnes Institute. Um, she just did a career training on um, surviving in a male-dominated culture and um, uh, surviving in academia as a woman. Um, she's going to talk about this. Um, the, uh, uh, our other guest is Emily Kuderi uh, from the University of Vermont. Can you make some noise and wave? Hello, I'm Emily. <laughs> Emily just started uh, her lab uh, last uh, last um, fall um, and um, wow. she is just uh, making her first experiences as being a PI and um, she also just moved from a, a mainly male to a mainly female department so she has some interesting stories to sh share from there and lastly uh, we have Asle. Um, Asle Ozarek is um, a senior, the most senior person in the discussion today. Um, she is a PI at um, the Donnes Institute for Brain Cognition and Behavior, where she's running the Gestures and Sign Language Lab. Um, and uh, yeah, she has experienced many different cultures, many different positions, and she can talk about her experiences um, throughout, um, throughout her career. And she has a lot to, sh to share, I'm sure. Um, so she's also starting the session and um, she's first going to talk about um, general topics in academia and um, the struggles and obstacles women encounter. So I'm very interested to hear about this now and uh, a warm welcome to all of you and I now give the word to Asle. You're still on mute. Asle, you're on mute. Okay, okay. I'm fine now? Yes. Okay, okay. Uh, hello everyone, I'm Asle. Um, I would like to thank Francisca, first of all, for providing this opportunity. Um, I think it's very nice to have this informal, but at the same time, international forum to talk about these things. Uh, it's the first time I'm doing this, and uh, but uh, when Francisca emailed me, I thought, okay, well, I really, you know, I would like to do this. <laughs> um, um, of course, my experiences might not maybe generalize to everyone because um, I started my career in Turkey. I, I did my undergraduate uh, in Turkey and then I moved to University of Chicago to do my PhD. And I spent five years there. So then I had to get used to the American culture and, you know, surviving the PhD life. Um, after that, I got a postdoc at the Max Planck Institute uh, in Netherlands, and um, I moved to Holland for three years. Uh, then it was my postdoc experience, and then I got a, um, a assistant professorship at Koch University in Istanbul again. So I moved to Istanbul. I was there three years, so I also experienced uh, 
the Turkish context as being like higher level in academia. Um, and then um, I moved back to Holland, to Radboud University, Max Planck Institute. Um, then I got several grants, um, I think from the 2003 till now, I have been getting grants. So I, I have constantly, once one a career grant ended, then I moved to the other one. And along the way, I became professor. <laughs> um, and I think in the last 10 years, I had I built my PI group. And now I think right now my PI group is the biggest now, like 20 people. Um, so how did I experience being a woman? Um, I mean, at the beginning, I didn't really realize that, I mean, I was, uh, you know, I was really a woman doing this um, because at the beginning of your PhD, PhD, then I mean, you don't. I don't know. Maybe women now feel it more. But um, when I was doing my PhD, I didn't feel like being a woman was issue because everybody was really nice. <clears throat> so I mean, if you're, I mean, it's my experience. So if you're you know, lower, lowest in the rank, and you're asking questions, you want to know, I mean, you, you are this person who is not threat to anyone, and everybody wants to help you. I mean, the male colleagues, I mean, they like this helping a younger woman. So then you're fine. Um, but then the senior I got, the more I grant I got, um, then it becomes a bit more difficult because then the, I felt like the male colleagues don't know what to do with you. So because you're not really lower than them anymore. So you're kind of competing with them. So then, um, so that that's when, um, you know, you're not going them to ask for help. But um, so that's like when you start getting ignored a little bit. So in conferences, so the people who would come and talk to you all the time, then they kind of start ignoring you or it's kind of hard to get into the cliques of in cocktails and it's like all males gather. And then when you come in, then they ask you about your daughter or about your, I mean, they ask you personal things, but not about work anymore. I mean, that's how I started feeling like. Um, but of course, this, the more senior you get, then you become professor. Um, th then, yeah, then you're really alone in a lot of meetings. I mean, especially in Holland. So I'm in a lot of boards and uh, um, a bit more uh, like administrative meetings. Then, then I'm always the only woman or one of the two women. Um, then, then it feels lonely. Uh, but I feel like they start to take you a bit more seriously again. But then again, you feel like you're the only one. Um, so these are some of the changes that take place, I think. When you start your career, you're, it's more OK to be a woman. But I think the more senior or older you get, then it gets really hard. Because then you're really closed off from the, like, um, um, from the circles where decisions are made, like important talks are made, and you're left out. I, I, I'm not, I don't think this is strategic, but it's just the way it is. Um, and then another, um, um, some other issues come up when you're a PI as a woman, because you have sometimes male students or postdocs, or sometimes, and you have women, postdocs or women PhDs. So the issue is how to deal with that situation. <laughs> so that that I realized, okay, well, this is yet another issue. Yeah, I I, 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 I still haven't solved this issue, but uh, you know, so when you're the senior, but the woman, then how do you, how do you deal with your PhDs and uh, do you treat them differently than your male PhDs and male postdocs? It's uh, also another issue. Yeah, this is also something I noticed that it's hard sometimes to deal with um, with people who are junior to you compared and that 
it's very hard to be taken seriously, but still be perceived as a nice, accessible person. And um, that there's a really fine line between like keeping respect and a professional a professional relationship with each other, but also like not slipping into all one of these stereotypes, either being being too too much of a mother for a person you're supervising, for example, or um, yeah, or being too much controlling or being too much hands off so that you don't care or that you are only caring about your own. It's a difficult it's a difficult situation. Yes, because I think the these type of roles where women are less defined than for men but i mean i don't want to generalize of course but uh i mean because let's say women see more men as pis and role models they they have more of a general idea about what kind of behaviors they should expect from them but if you're a woman then there are fewer examples then it gets a little bit yeah it's also yeah, well, yeah. It's also a very established culture. So also one thing I realized when I came from uh, being a bachelor or master's student um, then to doing a PhD and now being a postdoc, I realized that many of my male colleagues and friends, um, they very early on already start building support networks with each other. And then they give each other a leg up and they are really supportive. But somehow there is it's more of a taboo to do this uh, like from men and women together. Um, maybe because uh, people higher up are afraid that this looks weird to other colleagues, or I don't know what is the case, but there seems to be there seems to be some tension between this and that. I just see how men are so much better with building these networks which support each other and give each other a leg up, whereas women really struggle and are solo fighters in that sense. Mm -hmm. Well, we can also click a lot with each other as well. I mean, we can also use that as a um, as a tool to get a lot to go high up. And I, I, my experience in the U.S. was that like a lot of women PIs click together a lot mm -hmm. in certain uh, topics. They they also have their own clicks, but I mean. So when you move from like PhD to PI to senior researcher. I think you just have to realize a lot of social relations, how they work with gender. So, yeah, I mean, you just have to strategize yourself in these things. But of course, we shouldn't expect things as they are now. That's why I think all these Me, Me Too movements and Twitters and all of these things help. So I, I found myself um, over the years always trying to maybe like line up with women or get some grants with them or yeah, i was trying to find like sneaky ways to for the success but but this was accepting the male world as it is you mm -hmm. see what i mean but now i think oh with all these moments i think males are being aware that some things have to change yeah. so we can hope for a more cooperative situation now than before before I was trying to just avoid the, for years I avoided the problem, but now I think maybe it's also try to good to try to change it or put it on table. I don't know. Emily, you just uh, you just moved one really really big step upwards. How did you experience that change? <clears throat> yeah, so I just started a. Um, I moved from a postdoc position to a assistant professor position in the last few months, so first real job. <laughs> um, and it's been interesting because I, when I did graduate at the University of Vermont um, and worked there with a, um, I think she was a postdoc at the time, but she, um, she kind of worked with her as a research assistant and she kind of took me under her wing and taught me everything I know about research, but she was quite low level, you know, she was a postdoc at the time. Um, and since that, since going to graduate school, I've really been working with males. So um, my graduate degree I did at the University of Nottingham in England um, with a male professor. Um, and then after that, left to do a postdoc at Johns Hopkins with a male PI. Um, and in both of those departments, you know, the chair of the department was male, the dean was male. Um, and so now I'm in the department um, communication science and disorders at the University of Vermont, which is primarily female, 
there's actually two, it's a small department, but there's two men in our department, one of whom is retiring in the spring and being replaced by a woman. <laughs> so we're actually going to have a balance you know, or a, um, a shift in the other direction. But the chair of my department is a, a woman and the dean is a woman as well. Um, and so it's been, it's going to be interesting to see. I've only been there since, you know, since August. So it's going to be interesting to see how it all, um, how it feels different in terms of having those role models be women as opposed to um, as opposed to men. <clears throat> but can I, can I say something? Yeah. Yes. So because now you don't need role models because you, you no, are your role model. <laughs> right. Now I'm my own role model, yeah. It's interesting seeing the dean as a, um, you know, we only have maybe six or seven colleges at the University of Vermont. And so um, having a dean as a woman, I think, is still a minority at that level of um, administration. So, and she is one of the most genuine people I've ever met. And still kind of seems, seems to somehow maintain, a, she has an aura of mothering about her, but still in a very powerful professional way. So, um, you know, she's still, she listens to her faculty members and she does everything she can to make sure that they're successful. Um, so it feels very supportive, almost in a motherly way, but she still kind of can exert her, her power as a dean, you know? So it's interesting to see how she balances that. So I think that'll be a good um, a good role model for me. Do you feel a strong shift in hierarchy now that you're not a postdoc anymore and you're supervising students and research assistants? A little bit, yeah. Um, it's interesting supervising. I did some supervising of students before, but it's interesting now that I'm doing the research on my PI um, and I'm taking on undergraduate and graduate students. Um, so I'm also trying to strike that balance between how much of a friend do I am I to them versus a supervisor? And you know, I don't want to come across as too formal. I want them to be able to approach me with things, but I don't want to, you know, be buddy buddy with them either. So I'm still trying to walk that line um, between professionalism and mentorship. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, but I, at this point, I wonder whether males feel this way too when they move to a PI position. Yeah. Do they worry about this as much as women? I don't know. I have found that in my teaching. I've been doing, um, so I've done um, teaching about half of my time. And my class in the fall was a very big class, 75 students. And so I did get the sense kind of, um, you know, again, I tried to strike this balance between being friendly and interesting and also professional. But I got the sense after the first exam when they kind of, they saw that oh, I'm not going to be very, you know, the first exam they found quite difficult. And so they, I kind of got this, I sensed the shift in terms of, oh, she's not as, you know, just easy, this easy professor that we had in mind. You know, she's actually, she knows her stuff. She takes this class seriously. She's not going to be a pushover. Um, and I did have some students trying to push me on grades and deadlines and everything. And so I had to stand my ground quite a bit. But I think once I established that, um, you know, that I wasn't going to be a pushover, then they, they respected me more for it, so. I want to hit one thing up, uh, as I said earlier, that uh, you felt that there was this U-shaped curve from your seniority level, um, from how people took you serious and did, dealt with you. And I think this is really interesting. Um, and um, I want to ask you, do you think this is something which is mainly gender specific or also has something has a lot to do with the career stage you're in of like not being junior anymore and not needing as much supervision and mentoring but on the other hand like not being fully established yet so people don't really know yet whether they have to commit or should commit to you because you might still drop out and go to industry or something or <laughs> i don't know <laughs> no but i mean there's also competition aspect right i mean Sure. So that then, like, I mean, first they approach you because they think you need uh, you need their advice, so they can feel good about themselves. They can help a woman, and you know, or they can show off how good a successful man they are, and you know. Um, but then, when they feel like you're competing with them, 
then they have to go and like talk to other males where they can align and you know because they feel like oh they they are not in a position to show the way to you but now they're trying to like get you out of the picture um i mean i'm not saying they're doing this just because you're women but i i think as you said maybe they think you're you're not going to survive anyway you're a woman and you just happen to get to a postdoc position but well let's see or something like that <laughs> so then you become invisible for a long time but then but i think if you survive enough some way or another uh, then they see you again in like a, these whatever high level meetings then then they end up like okay well like maybe i'll take you seriously or something <laughs> so i mean like that that's how how it feels now yeah. was there a big difference between how males treated you during this time versus how other female fellow researchers or colleagues treated you or yeah, of course. Just, uh, yeah of course they're different yeah i mean you know then like you try to align with the other females anyway so females help each other or senior females or middle females they help each other but because they all feel like they are left out mm -hmm. uh, so, but but there are fewer of them and they are not always in high power positions and so yeah, yeah. but there it's less competitive with each other and it's more supportive. yeah exactly it's more cooperative yeah definitely definitely yeah yeah, yeah. 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 interesting yeah so um but but i didn't know this was happening like in the middle stages mm -hmm. I, I just like lived through it but then it started then i really started feeling female like okay well there's something going on <laughs> why am i always left out in the cocktails or something yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah um maybe um now is a good time to uh, switch to atsuko um who uh, recently attended a training and she wanted to share with us uh, what she learned there and then we can discuss how like how useful these things are and how generalizable across cultures okay um uh, so i started my career back in japan and moved to the netherlands almost 15 years ago and there was a big cultural difference there so i'm not quite sure whether what i feel personally is the cultural difference or whether it's gender difference. Um, so I think that there are some things that we can, um, there are similar things that I, as a Japanese woman, I felt more sort of put in a lower, looked down at more than the males. Um, here coming to the Netherlands, it might be the cultural difference that I'm being too modest, that I don't speak out in a more direct way that is being appreciated more in this culture than what it was in Japan. So the, the, the line between what is gender, what is culture is for me a little bit difficult. But um, so what, I, uh, what was interesting was I took this uh, career uh, advancement for women, uh, program the whole year last year and there were a, a, a few workshops and some lectures that uh, we listened to that was quite interesting to hear some of them we already knew because we've been hearing about the problems in gender biases and such and such so some things were repeated but um some things i found quite interesting was um and maybe this is a repetition as well but uh, what was emphasized is that um we are brought up as girls and boys in a different way so there's already some difference in the way we perceive things as a boy or a girl so as a female or a male and um, as a child the boys are more competitive and they go like i got this well i got this even bigger things and they they like that in their childhood whereas women uh, the girls are more cooperative they sort of um prioritize harmony and that comes back to what Asla mentioned a little bit a while ago about uh, women being more cooperative and the guys being more competitive so that's something that seems to be in innate sort of how we are grown up to be what we should be that um, women tend to um, 
emphasize more harmony, cooperativeness as being something that is more uh, productive. Whereas the males have the idea that being competitive, being um, becoming above somebody else is the way to pro progress. So that's sort of the mental uh, difference that we tend to have been brought up. And so, uh, but since the, the culture as such is still male dominated, the program sort of emphasis on saying, well, you know, we have to know how the games are played in the male ground. And adjust ourselves to fit into the situation and then on to sort of make ourselves as women more visible before being able to change the society as such because that's the big thing but first we need to sneak into the male dominated environment and um, then once we're there maybe we can start changing how people perceive different things <coughs> And um, so some of the things that was interesting, uh, another thing that um, Asla mentioned about the not being able to uh, join into the cocktail, um, another thing that was interesting was um, networking. And it's always good to do networking in order to get yourself visible, to get into the circle, to get yourself known, even to get a position. If you have personal connections, you're at a better chance than if you're not a known person. And also uh, something that was interesting to me was that a lot of things are decided not at the meeting, but before the meeting happens. And a lot of the cases, these are corridor chats and things. So males, if they get together and they have you know, chats about, oh, what about this? We should talk about this in the next meeting. We, well, I have this idea. These things already happen before the meeting takes place. So, um, and then if the males start talking about their um, you know, hobbies, for instance, and during the conversation, it evolves to something that is more work-related, women have a less chance of being involved in this um, important decision making which happens already before the meeting and so uh, the the program sort of um, told us that these things do go on in the behind that we should be aware of um, it's difficult to find a, a solution to these things because these things already happen without us being involved but at least i thought it was good to be um, to be aware of that, that these things are going on and uh, so that was the thing to get um, recognized to be visible the guys tend to do that in a more naturalistic way and that's why we have to be a little bit more uh, we have to put a little bit more emphasis on what we do than what we normally do as sort of as an average so because the guys on average do a bit more in order to be level with them we should be less modest and uh, be a little bit more expressive in what we do or what we have done and not take it for granted that if you put on a lot of effort that everything will be recognized and acknowledged so you have to really put in words i did this i was the one who put in the ideas in order for that to be recognized because the guys do that all, all the time already but women tend to be a little bit more modest that's sort of the things that uh, we were told and i thought oh that's interesting and i do see some clicks that what i heard is what is going on with me as well did they give concrete advice like how you can uh be like like very concrete examples where where can we be um more uh, less modest or more demanding or how can we get into this inside meeting talks and or get over the fact that they already talked about things before meetings or um yeah like where are good points where women can get their foot in the door in that sense or um actually change their behavior in order to be um more accessible or more part um so one of the things, maybe an example, is um, the, 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 the order of the authorship in a paper. Um, it's really, really 
difficult to ask for a last authorship in something that I had contributed much more than a professor right at the end of the author list, for instance. But um, so, first of all, I shouldn't just stop and say, well, I'm only a postdoc, so I only deserve the second authorship rather than the last. And uh, so, another thing that uh, came up in the program was negotiation. Uh, you have to start the negotiation if you want to achieve something, you if you want to get something from another person. But you should take the, a no as a no. That was uh, another thing that I learned as uh, something interesting. Uh, if I say, I think I deserve something and something, well, you know, different phrasing, but you say that, oh, well, I think I deserve this. And the other person says, no. I would probably step back and said, okay, I'm not good enough. But that's not the way to go. You say, you should push yourself because no is a starting of a negotiation point. That's something I really thought was a good point that I learned through the program. Uh, because then you're sort of also um, putting an up um, proposition by saying no. But then that then you can say, well, but I've done this and this and this, so maybe not maybe not this, but possibly something in between. So in doing the negotiation, do you come to a compromise that might be higher than you end up if you being modest? It might not be the thing that you opt for in the beginning, but at least you get yourself a little bit further. Yeah. And uh, so if you think that this negotiation is a sort of a talk between I propose this, you propose that, we come to a compromise. So setting up the negotiation point, the starting point to a higher place and coming down to what your actual goal is might be something that you could strategically do. Yeah. And in yeah. terms of networking, was there also concrete advice? Because it's hard to enter or yeah, it's, it's hard to become part of an already established network. So women can probably easier network with other women or find other um, types of networks where they can easier find a way in, but it's very hard to, to get into already established ways. So what are strategies which can help so that we can either interact with existing networks without necessarily becoming part or how we can become part or yeah get be visible and be acknowledged by um, other people in the field well maybe if you can start talking about football that might be an easy start over a glass of beer or so but i think um, having these opportunities drinks after work friday drinks these things where you have both male and female colleagues that's a nice opportunity just you know there you don't have any male groups and female groups and you can already start there in the same i think that's one way you can start getting into the circle of guys yeah you're on mute ashley um it's difficult for me to say oh I have failed in so many things, so <laughs> I can talk about the failure, but uh, that might not help. <laughs> no, what I'm saying, like what I'm saying, going to the uh, pub also doesn't work for females with children. I mean, was the last time I went to a pub with anyone? Like in the last twelve years, never. Yeah, <laughs> you always have to rush to get your kid from A to B, and yeah. It's not possible. What strategies do you suggest instead? Well, I mean, as I said, I didn't, you, I, I couldn't use these strategies because, I mean, first of all, I was aware of them. I mean, I now and now, like Atsuko talks about, we, we talk about these things more. It, it really helps, you know. But I didn't know, so I was just like left out. But I did my own. I mean, like. I mean, as a result, I had to work super hard. So I had to make sure that I have like three career grants like in a row 
but also that holds your health and uh, you know mental health, physical health, and so you you think that you have to prove more and more to be visible. Yeah. Yeah. I personally experience that social media is actually a really good tool for um, for women to network with each other and just by using Twitter and uh, being active in different Facebook groups uh, which are regarding uh, topics in my field and I can discuss with uh, with other researchers um, just opened a lot of connections which I otherwise probably wouldn't have and yeah, you're right not not to, like one of the one of the most probably important connections which I made via social media uh, was with uh, people who actually were at the Mont Blanc Institute before I was there um, and this is uh, this is Christina Bergman and Sho uh, Zui uh, who have the cocktails blog and just by interacting with them and talking a lot I met a lot of people I had a lot of visibility and opportunities and um, yeah we hardly like I had short overlap with show and two institutes, but most of our connection with each other is mainly via social media and it's really carried by this. And it's it's just really nice that you know that you have a network and that you have support despite of uh, being continents apart. And uh, mm -hmm. this is extremely yeah, useful. Yeah. I mean, I agree because, for example, I also caught connect with more male more established colleagues through twitter that i would talk to them in a conference probably they wouldn't talk to me on conference but now and then they retweet my tweet or they ask me for a paper so i think that's an you know that's a step forward <laughs> yeah and uh, yeah it's just um and um then in terms of networking, I also have the feeling many people are very willing to network, but it's hard to get out of their comfort zone. So I have the feeling as a woman, you often have to go this extra step of engaging contact and actually establishing contact. So um, one um, one strategy I actually learned from Emily was uh, to just email people after conferences or before conferences and to arrange meetings out of the sessions where it's sometimes hard to actually get a good talk with each other and to actually have a good conversation because it's too busy and people are stressed run from one meeting to the other and just to already offer a conversation um, long before you actually see each other or to 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 follow up on this by email yeah, yeah. Being successful with networking is, um, maybe making contact at conferences and kind of filling up the posters or, or talks or something and saying that was interesting, but then it's the follow-up emails, um, which is why I always, if possible, you know, if I'm presenting a poster, I never have physical handouts, I have an email list because I want to make that contact with people afterwards. If I just hand out a poster, then they just walk away and I have no idea who came and on my, on my poster. Um, and I, you know, I'm a big proponent of just emailing people out of the blue and saying, I'm interested in your research. You know, I think either, you know, when I was a student, I did this and this is how I spent about six months at the NIH during my PhD um, doing a study there because I just emailed the, the PI and said, I'm interested in your research. I'm looking for an experience. You know, do you have any space in your lab? And he wrote back and said, sure, come on over. Um, and in terms of networking, that's, that's worked out well too. I've just kind of emailed people and said, I saw this. I saw your poster. I saw this recent article that you wrote. I think it's really interesting. Here's what I do. Are you ever, you know, if you're ever interested in a collaboration, then keep me in mind. And kind of just getting that ball rolling, um, and that's led to quite a, lot, quite a few good collaborations so far. And just kind of, yeah, making making connections that way. So, um, and I think it's sometimes easier, maybe particularly for women, to do this over email because there's not that face to face. What do I say in the moment kind of a thing? You know, you can structure, you can think about what you're going to write. It's a bit more anonymous or informal to do it over email. Um, and my my thought is always, well, what's the worst that can happen? They can just not respond, right? Whereas getting that, you know, if you go to approach somebody at a conference and say something like that, and then they don't, they're not interested, then there's a lot of negative social feedback that you would get from it. But email is kind of removes that, that whole aspect of it. Yeah, that's true. And like when I when I was younger and or, or like more junior, um, I I just saw that like male were so at ease with networking with each other, and I just had 
trouble doing the same thing and it was really hard for me to get in mm -hmm. um either because of my socialization or why and also i just don't have that thick of a voice so it's very hard for me to get heard in poster sessions or where there's a lot of surrounding noise and people discussing a lot so i just really struggled in this, in this very social situation to make myself visible and being heard and um I just eventually realized and learned from others that I have to come up with other strategies of coping with this because otherwise I'm going to be left out. So, but I really believe that women have, still have to make this extra step. And um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, but but I think these social settings I find still the hardest because then if you're senior enough, sometimes you are the only invited speak woman invited speaker with like other five males or something so those are the most awkward times which actually now i don't accept invitations if i'm the only woman or or even one of the two women i don't go go, go to the work sometimes what happens is that you go out to dinner and then with these five males and then you have no one to talk to even even then mm -hmm. You know, like five senior men and you're the only woman, they talk to each other. I mean, that happened to me like two months ago. I was like, okay, well, talk to me now. I mean, you invited me, you invited me to dinner. I'm here, talk to me. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's not even a cocktail where I'm trying to like get into a conversation. <laughs> you paid my way, you wanted to listen to me, but then like, why are you not talking to me during dinner? Mm -hmm. These are the things like I can still understand, but I, I think that these face-to-face -face situations are the hardest ones. I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we need to go on. But I do think that, um, that there's just like, first we just grew up in a culture where gender roles are so strong on us and it's hard to get out of them. But then it's also hard to like, first you have to navigate this gender tension, which is maybe there, but then on top of this, you also have to figure out, oh, do we have anything in common? Do we have something to talk about? And then there are these five people with whom you do have something to talk about. So it's much more easier to engage in a conversation and be comfortable. Whereas um, this other person, um like you would like to get them in but you don't really know how to so i think it's, it's rather than uh bad intentions or people actually having an explicit bias in the situations or um or um like actually having a negative attitude i think it's much more that people are really awkward and don't really know what to do in the situations um and whether they're aware of it or not, it doesn't really change it. But this is also what makes it so difficult. It's not a conscious of, of, of obvious problem. It's just, it's just always there and it's hard to get around it and we're all stuck in it. And I sometimes really had the impression that just speak it like when the when the situation is tense and you feel that this is a thing right now just to talk about it or like make a joke about it just to ease the, the atmosphere of it because otherwise it's unbearable um and sometimes to just address the problem right away and be very confrontational about it like not aggressive or um like like have uh, making the other person feel guilty but just just to put the elephant on the table <laughs> Or just to talk about the elephant in the room and then just get 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 it away <laughs> yeah that's like we can't hear you yeah i mean i think like what i would advise is like atuko said to be aware of this situation every moment you know like every moment you have to be aware of it <laughs> and then you you, you, this should be your meta thinking all the time. So like, I, I think in the last three years, I'm never acting like na naturally. I'm always calculating, I'm always thinking, you know, like, so we have to move this way and we have to give each other advice, what works, what doesn't work. And as you said, like put it on table, not be confrontational as you said, but okay, say something like, yeah, don't do this, don't say that. Maybe this is not appropriate or something. A and I do it. And it kind of works, I think. Yeah, there's always like a bit, little bit of a shock at the beginning, 
But then they're like, oh, okay, you know. <laughs> yeah. But then again, men are also difficult for them to deal with such a situation rather than uh, than just having it that silent about it and trying to navigate it like by intuition. <laughs> Yeah. So um, I think we can move to a like, broader discussion maybe later, but one topic we haven't talked about much yet, but uh, you already mentioned it, Asli, when you said that like a lot of social events you actually can't uh, participate in because you have a daughter. Um, and um, I think um, having a family or um, having children and being an academic is a very challenging situation for many, many reasons. Um, not only because we often don't live in a country where we have family which can help us dealing with it and um, also just because our times are not normal nine to five jobs or often not and we travel a lot for conferences and research visits so um, this is challenging to deal with with um, with uh, a family and children and um, I also think it's very important to talk about the male side of this because I became friends with Yoet and he's really also struggling um, with attitudes towards life, work-life balance because he's a man and people expect him to invest for his entire career and all his time into this. And there's very little understanding of the fact that he's also a father and has a family to take care of. So um, yeah, I'm absolutely not qualified to talk about this topic, but I give the word to Emily and Yoet to, um, to, to talk about this. Uh, Emily, would you like to start? <laughs> yeah, so I um, I have a daughter who's almost two, and I'm actually pregnant with my second, um, due in June. So it's been yeah, it's been interesting seeing how um, how the balance <laughs> has changed since having a child. Uh, and I had my daughter in, as a postdoc, and now kind of having started uh, you know an assistant professor position. Um, things have changed a little bit just because the postdoc, you know, it was much more um, purely research and kind of much more flexible schedule, whereas now I'm teaching and meetings and all sorts of things. And my husband is also a, um, an academic and has kind of a similar type of schedule. So it's, yeah, it's been, it's been interesting figuring out that balance. And I think what I have noticed has been the biggest challenge has been conferences actually um both finding the time to go to conferences you know because often they fall either during the academic semester or something where i'm when i'm teaching or they fall at a time when my husband's also got a conference and who's going to go to which one and um so figuring out the timing of that and then also um you know sorting out child care and all that, all that kind of thing. So I only just recently in the last few weeks went to the first conference in years <laughs> where I, I didn't have my family traveling with me and it was just me and I could kind of take my time and, you know, network with the, the colleagues that I had there and actually attend all of the conference as opposed to kind of coming in late and leaving early because I had to get back to the family or leaving early for dinner because I had plans with the family, you know, so um it was refreshing <laughs> to to do that, but that was the first time in in years that I'd been able to to do that. And so um, that's at least what I've noticed um, has been the biggest the biggest shift. But it's also um, yeah, not being able to go out for dinners or drinks afterwards because we have to we have to go pick up my daughter. Or um, I've had to be I've had to put very strict boundaries in place in terms of I don't work on the weekends. I don't try to work in the morning anymore because mornings are so chaotic as as it is and trying to get anything done is kind of is useless so I've had to I've had to both restructure my work schedule and also how I think about my work schedule since having a, a child but I'd be interested to hear your experience too you had so uh, I'd like to weigh in a little bit about the issue of gender bias and I gotta say it's a super important discussion and it's very interesting to me to hear uh, and also because I, I actually uh, I lost the word, but I feel you know, a lot of things that you were talking about is very relevant to me as well. Uh, visibility and networking, not just the, and and I think uh, being a minority here in this discussion is a male. But I think for me and this is probably very individual uh, struggling coming from a different country 
to the U.S. Uh, that has to do with it, and you were talking about the, the cultural uh, biases. Um, so I just want to also put that on the table. And I just saw the other night uh, the movie The Post with Meryl Streep and, and Tom Hanks, which is a very interesting movie, and, and I thought it was really good. And the issue of gender bias there was very evident, uh, even though the, you know, the, the women, all the discussion was in the room between the males, as you mentioned before, but at the end, Meryl Streep was a female. She, she had the last voice in the game. Um, so I just want to say that I think, I think these issues, they're, at least I as a male, as a postdoc, also struggle. And I think other male friends of mine, it's my position as a postdoc also, started with networking visibility and, and, and getting your voice heard. I think, I think, uh, I do think that women have it harder, as you said, I, I really do think that. Um, so that's just want to say that. But then going back to the issue of, of what I just thought of characterizing as a parent bias, um, I think there are three main issues that are very important for, for parents, whether they're males or females, which is uh, a support system that helps you, um, work stability, and, and financial aspects. And I think at the postdoc level, for me, we are, we are currently struggling with three of these issues because, uh, so I'm going to echo out of what Emily just said, but I'm still struggling at the postdoc level. Uh, trying to balance all of these things together. My wife is not an academic, uh, so that's that potentially adds complexity here because we moved from a place that we had at least a support system and stability to come here for, for me and I have to justify that. And we so I we have two kids. Our daughter is over six and our son is four. So our daughter luckily started kindergarten that, that lowers a lot of financial weight over her. Um, but it's still, it's quite expensive. And you have the postdocs here, which are usually, you know, the, the salaries are much regulated by NIH or NSF. It's quite similar. It's quite low for, for supporting the family. Uh, you, often people coming out of the country here, uh, their spouse doesn't work or it takes a lot of time to work. Um, and that is, is, is very uh, challenging. And then and we're talking about before about the flexibility. So we, we supposedly in this job have a lot of flexibility. I go to all of my kids' events, which are during regular day hours because my wife is working in a job that doesn't have this flexibility. But then I work all through the nights and the weekends, and my kids have often said, "Close the computer, Dad. We wanna we want you to play with us." And, and that that always breaks my heart in the sense that you know, we have kids, we want to be with them, and, and not being able to find the balance at this postdoc level where it's so pressured to find a job, but as I understand, it gets it stays pretty challenging even the next step and the following steps after that. So I think uh, as, as uh, in academia or you know, as a community, being more aware of, of the challenges of parents, males and females, and, and uh, trying to think about establishing some sort of, of, of uh, support processes to, to help. So uh, there was a PNAS paper on and care, daycare service services in, in, in conferences, which is great. But also dads want to bring their children. The first conference I ever went to, a very prominent PI was with his daughter and he gave the keynote speech and he said, it's the most important thing to bring your kids to conferences. And I would love to do that, but I can't financially, network wise, as we said before, I don't have the ability to do that. Uh, and I haven't gone to a pub I don't know how many years as well, at least since I moved here you know, to socialize. I do the what I can, but um, yeah, so I, I definitely relate to all the things we said, and I think you know, it's a complex, there's a lot of complexities and, and should be some sort of way, so maybe by people bring these, putting these elephants on the table <laughs> can help us uh, try to deal with it, because I think 
I don't know, I, I, Israel, I'm from Israel, and Israel we start later, and so when we get to the post like stage, mostly when you already have families, but then you move here, and that's not always the case, so there's got to be, but the, there should be some better realization for the institutes from, from, to, to make this easier from this very challenging sort of level where you work as hard as you can, just trying to get a, a some security, stability, financial stability, all, all these things. I think the very least what universities, especially like these big players, which have a lot of international researchers coming as temporary staff, I think the very least, even when like finances aside, the very least they should offer is some in-house or like some institutionalized uh, help systems and support systems, um, whether this is an institute daycare or um, something like this, or just to help you navigate this process. So the, the, because you're just temporarily somewhere for a few years and you don't have your family around, you don't have friends yet, you don't yeah. have a system yet, you don't even you don't even understand how taxes work. Like you have to figure out all these things and this is already so hard. And then navigating all these things on the side and like having more money probably would solve a lot of problems because you can uh, you can have a nanny and you can have you can have you can have people paid for doing these things for you, but um, yeah, like I, I also see that this is not necessarily possible. But at least to offer the international stuff some kind of support system, which makes it more feasible for them. Okay, so uh, it's two things. Uh, I, I I was for a little bit of time at Brown University, and my daughter's preschool was five minutes walk from my office building. Mm -hmm. That's solved a lot of our problems. Then time and trying to coordinate everything um, but uh, oh, the second thing I was going to say um, talk about uh, money and institutionalized support systems and uh, helping you set up for your family or like in general to, to I forgot the other thing I want to say but yeah so I think having uh, having those there are daycare centers at all institutions but there are for Oh, I want to say that I remember that thing. I'm a U.S. citizen, which I thought would make my life easier coming here, but actually made it a lot more. So I'm not considered as an international, mm -hmm. whatever staff, faculty, student, postdoc, and I don't get uh, so international students do get support with families that I would not be eligible for mm -hmm. because I'm not international. I still see them struggling, and it's not that it's easy for them. No, I agree, I agree, things. but you know, there seems to be, you know, yeah, understanding the tax, taxes, as, as you said, yeah. uh, would have made my life much easier if they were. But, but it's like, like the first day I came, it's not, anyway. Yeah. But there's been a lot of situations where I had no, I had no idea what to do, and there's no one to ask, but, yeah. uh, because of your weird sort of limbo situation. Mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, orthogonal to <laughs> yeah. all of this. Do you have ideas what, what good solutions would be for these things? Me? Or Emily? Yeah. Everybody? <laughs> <laughs> I agree that, yeah, some sort of support system, having some sort of support system like that in place, daycares or whatever, is so important. But those are often empty. <laughs> and you know, daycares are, are, at least in Vermont, where I am, you know, they're so tight. We have, there's a daycare at the University of Vermont that's for specifically for employees with their families. And the wait list was 18 months, <laughs> you know, which is not useful at all if you've just moved to the area, you know. So the, because there's so many limitations on how many children they can accept, and that's so few relative to the number of, of employees or um, researchers, it's just necessarily going to be that in demand that it's going to be so difficult. So um, I have found, so we actually moved, we moved to the University of Vermont, mostly because we have family nearby here, um, and we just have a better support system um, here. So we were incredibly lucky to be able to get jobs at this university, and so I also have family nearby, and I agree, it does make it so much, it's so much easier to have, um, you know, in-laws just down the road that can jump in if there's a sick day or something like that, we need coverage at the last second. Um, but I'm interested, I don't know if you want to change the topic yet, but I'm interested you know, in your experience of when something comes up and, you know, you do get an invitation to go out for drinks afterward, after, uh, work or something like that. And you turn them down saying, oh no, I need to go to my family. What is, 
what's the response? Is it kind of surprised that you are putting your family before work or how is your kind of your role as a male? How does that played into your experience? So I've made it, I make it very clear to everyone that my family comes first and, and, and I actually often turn down invitations because I, I, mean, I, I have to go, I, well, one thing, I want to go and see my kids, mm -hmm. but then also uh, to help to help with my wife with, with managing the kids. So I don't go to all of this. I'm actually in, in a lab where there's a lot of social events. I, I, and we, we have to think, I have to plan ahead in fact so that it's, it's uh, fair uh, with my wife on managing all of this. Uh, but I, 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 I don't think I've ever felt that I was I got a some uh, surprise or negative response from anyone saying I'm not going because of being with my kids. And I, you know, I, I stay the minimum amount of time in conferences just to get back to my kids and, and uh, you know people that people I work with that don't have kids they find that surprising. But people that I interact with that do have kids. I mean, it's, it's so natural. You want to be as less away from your family as you can, or does again? That's my perspective. Do you have the feeling this has negative impacts? Uh, definitely. Uh, anyway, we were talking before about conferences and networking and interacting. And to me, that's the, the only way to move ahead. Uh, and but it's not only because of family issues, there's getting funding to go to these events. And, and there's a lot of it. Yeah. I haven't gone yet to an event with my kids, so I didn't have to actually say, no, I'm not going to this dinner because um, I just you know, live here and there's these things happening and sometimes I can I can go, and sometimes I, I, I can't, but I, I definitely think, uh, this is one of the uh, prices you pay, one of, one, one of the costs of mm -hmm. having kids. But if, if this, you know, if, if it's always for me, you know, having I have to choose from sort of a network event over, over my kids, if I can, I would always choose my kids first. And because you can network later, you can email, you can tweet, you can set up a meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, and if the other side is interested in meeting you, Theoretically, you can always find a different opportunity. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's never going to be the same as drinking or eating or being more relaxed social sort of interactions. But uh, but yeah. So I don't know. If that's a good answer. But uh. <laughs> Asla, is this different for you as a PI with taking care of Lala? You are on mute. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Um, no, I mean, I think there is no way around it. I mean, I don't know. It's hard. Uh, you know, my daughter is now 12. Uh, I mean, I mean, there are other issues and, you know, you, you always have to juggle so much. Yeah. Yeah. I, I find it very, very, very hard, you know? So, I mean, I think it's not only about being a woman, but the academic lifestyle where like nothing ever like ends. There are always emails in the middle of the night or every weekend you have to do something. I mean, it just never ends, you know? Yeah. Like if, if anything, it gets worse. So I, I don't know, like I think like there has to be a stop to academic expectations where like reviewers like stop like the journals stop sending you these automatic messages all the time or i mean there has to be some realistic expectations in academia about what academicians can do we just have to change the culture a little bit we cannot be on all the time yeah. i mean like well, yeah i mean yeah these automatic messages from journals, like, well, what's that supposed to mean? Like you get it on Easter, you got it like on Christmas or like, okay, you know that it's an automatic message, but it makes you feel bad, you know? Um, or, or the worst is these grant deadlines. I mean, in Netherlands, I don't know why they do it this way, but the Dutch Science Foundation, 
uh, when you have to submit a big grant, it is usually after Christmas vacation or after summer vacation. So I don't know how many Christmas and summer vacations I ended up feeling guilty or trying to work under 40 degrees in Turkey or, uh, you know, I, I think some little things can be made differently. It doesn't have to be this way. I mean, I understand the pressure, science, whatever science is not predictable, but why would a grant agency make their deadline like 5th of like January, right? There's no reason for that. Um, the, the microphone is off, Asle. No, I mean, I, I never understand these deadlines being this way, like completely thinking that like as, as mothers, you sh like you shouldn't take a holiday with your kids. You know, like the last uh, grant uh, I got is Vici, the uh, the big one. I mean, you have to write this whole grant for uh, like 20 of August. You have to submit it. I mean, <laughs> how is that possible? Yeah, well, you made it. Well, you made it. Yeah, I made it, but I think it has a cost. I mean. I mean, I feel very tired now, like, because I think I didn't stop since I was 25, like, whatever, I started PhD. I think I didn't get, like, holidays for the first 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't get better. <laughs> um, a few years back, I was at, um, at a trainee panel um, where it was about work-life balance. It was in one of the big conferences in my field. And there were a few senior researchers giving life advice. And there were, there were three, three women, I think, and one man on the panel. And the man, I was so outraged by what he suggested to this entire room full of PhD students and postdocs. And he literally said, well, if my wife wouldn't have given up her career and took care of the children, I probably wouldn't have made it. And this was all the advice he gave. <laughs> I was just so mad at this. Like, how can you say this and act like, like this is a normal thing? Like, this is something you should expect from people starting this career. And this is a sacrifice people should be willing to make. Yeah, I mean, I think on Twitter and so on, this is also something that people say, I work so hard and everybody should still work so hard. But I mean, that, that but I, the, that's not the way we should go. We are like, okay, how can you make it more manageable? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, be, because I, I think the system will fall apart if we do it this way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. Point in time to start uh, talking about like what would be structural changes which would really make a difference and which, on a long term perspective, um, could benefit on solving these problems and uh, moving forward to a better culture which is more inclusive and more understanding. Do you have ideas on this? <laughs> Me, 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 you mean? Everybody. Yeah, I mean, I, I, everybody. Yeah, I mean, for me, like old people who can make these decisions, uh, you know, I mean, they should think about these things and not, not take things for granted. Uh, but I think for to do these things, it's always important to have women in these, um, you know, university administration, like policy making programs or people in high level. Uh, um, committees and so on, they should always ask women perspective about how to make these things better and they have to take it on board, but not put it on the job ads like, oh, this is an equal opportunity employer, like all job ads have this, but it doesn't mean anything, right? Yeah, what does it mean? <laughs> Do I, I think, so, but I think it's important to uh, have as many of similar sort of dialogues uh, at different levels to to have people talk about all these issues to to help push forward change. And I know there are a lot of opportunities at different levels of the university, but I don't know exactly what's discussed there. But even in in, in undergrad uh, interest side classes to focus on gender biases, 
to have people aware from as early as possible. Um, and and once once the issues can be mapped out, and if it gets enough uh, potential inertia, then then that could lead to to, to change because right, there's a lot of constraints that I definitely you know, at our level we're not aware of financial issues with institutions and oh well, you know has right one at one point I was saying to, to this different place and different time a different stage of my career and one uh, asking for more financial stipend because of family situations so, and no, that we got to be fair for everyone. And I thought that that wasn't a fair response because when you have a family, you have kids, you're not similar to everyone. And you can find a way to try and balance these sort of, 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 of needs and and from both, for all the sides, right? You know, it's easy to say, okay, I we just need more money and let's solve everything. I definitely don't think that's true. Um, but having open dialogues uh, and right there, we're in, a, we're in a place and time where things have become more polarized like everywhere, especially I can say that from Israel. And, uh, we need to have these discussions to to at least be, to, to have both sides or any, all of the sides understand that everyone's going through a lot of the, the frustrations are similar. And a lot of some people have suggestions that I'll, I would love to hear. Love to hear about uh, advice from anyone that has that to how to be better, how to move ahead. Um, so I think I always believe in open dialogue. I think uh, encouraging that and encouraging highlighting all of these biases uh, could help us push forward into potential. Solutions or better culture. I definitely agree that that um, is really important. Yeah, I really agree on this one too. It's also one of the things which I really started doing now is talking open about the fact that I am not willing to work constant 60, 80 hour weeks. Like you can do this if you are on a deadline. You can do this for two or three weeks. You cannot do this for two or three years without having serious uh, consequences for your health, for your social life, and also for your productivity. Like, the, I, the, if I'm working fewer hours, but I can actually work focused on them, I'm much more productive than when I just spend all the time in the lab. And um, this is as hard as this is, especially when times are sometimes a bit tough and things are not working out perfectly well. Like sometimes you're on this wave of productivity and things just go well, but most of the time this is not necessarily the case. But then also just to always remind myself that I'm not going to be more productive if my force if I force myself, uh, even though I'm tired and I cannot. That's one of the things that I've found too is that I've had to shift the way that I think about work kind of very intentionally unplugged during the weekend and you know set strict I'm not going to respond to emails in the evening or, you know, um, and it's tough because you're always constantly thinking about all the other things I need to do. And, you know, I need to get to work early so I can start on my to-do list. But um, I think especially with having a family, it's so important to do that, to unplug and to dedicate your time. You know, so now my, my rule is that when I'm at home, I'm with my family work is for work, you know, but um, I think it took, I feel like I got very burnt out in during my PhD because of, I, I, push myself too hard. Um, and I think you're right that it's, you know, if you, if you push yourself constantly too hard, then it's, there's a lot of, there's so many negative ramifications, not just on your productivity, but on your, your physical and mental health that it's in the long run, that's, it's not good. Well, I totally agree with that as a psychiatrist as well. Um, people tend tend to get depressed and in the end the productivity goes really down if you suffer from that. And another thing, um, that one of the last things that I learned in the workshop was that you can say no for a better yes. And I thought that was a very nice advice that you can say no to um, some request from work or so because you have a better yes to a family obligation which is a more important thing for you and don't feel guilty in saying no because you're saying yes to a, a, a bigger cause but a bigger reason 
And that's sort of a mindset change that one needs to also be aware of and appreciate that um, saying no is not actually a bad thing. But well, you have to decide. You can't always say no, 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 and you become invisible. That's not uh, my point. But um, uh, every now and then you have to really think what is really important in my life as a whole, not just work, and make a decision and say no sometimes to work situations. And I think that's quite important to keep in mind about. This is also something, um, one, one of my favorite um, academic blogs regarding life in academia is um, The Professor is In. And um, they also had several blogs now which are um, often talk talking about also saying no to all the requests you get for your career or like for the job, not only for a better yes uh, outside your job or like outside your work, but also within that you just use the basically the take home message is that your standard answer should be no, unless it's something which can seriously help you advance your career. And if you do things like editing collections or like doing doing all these things, which are nice and good for networking, but they're not necessarily bringing you forward, but required from you to put a serious effort in and putting substantial time, this is just something you should say no to unless this really makes you move forward. Yeah, but then sometimes like when people are early in their careers, they might not prioritize, you know, it might be really hard to, because you want to like have a lot of uh, doors open you know, in yes. case you yes. need it, because you don't know which one is going to go anywhere, right? So that's what people do. They try to make as many connections or as many networking as possible. That's why they say yes to a lot of things. So it's not always easy. Which which one that you accept is going to move your career? So that, that's the hard thing. I mean, I don't know the answer, but that's why people end up trying to do a lot of things to see which one works. We got an audience, got an question. audience question to, um, to that, um, issue. that issue, and this is that um, that uh, women are often or female researchers are often ranked lower than male researchers because um, they have less publications or less output, and often also because they have to say no because they have to they are main caretakers of family. So, is this actually the case that women have less or less quality publications or? Um, why is this the case and um, is there a way we can improve this or like change rankings for um, ranking the output of researchers? Well, I mean, I think like it should be about quality, but not quantity anyway. I mean, like when I have to like make a decision about like, because now I sit in a lot of, a lot of selection committees and things like that. Well, because I'm the only one of the senior women, so then I have to be in a lot of committees. That's another problem, of course. Um, but then I don't look at the quantity usually. I look at the quality. So, I mean, is this person doing something for herself, something original? Um, like, are, are they, like, having their own path? Um, so th these are the things I look at, but uh, I don't know. I, I, I don't look at the quantity, really. I, I, I think it should be the way, and also more for women than men, I think. They should be uh, evaluated on the quality. Um, another um, audience question we got earlier is, um, that um, how to deal with um, very established senior people in academia who are not very aware of uh, gender issues or generally the the problems of the hierarchy and the dominance between being very um, very important and high profile and how to interact with uh, junior researchers especially if they're women and uh, one of the one of the situations when I received this question, which first came to my mind was when I was a PhD student, I had lunch with a very well-established, uh, high-profile um, 
researcher in my field and we had a very nice conversation but it was also in a very open spot in uh, in a canteen where a lot of other researchers could pass uh, would pass by and then this other senior researcher um just came saw this this person and they had apparently some theoretical conflict going on and uh, with a previous discussion and this person just jumped at my conversational partner shoved me literally off the table and uh, started a fight with this person and me being a phd student and very um inconfident about the situation i didn't really know what to do so i just left and went away and uh, this, I just felt horrible in this situation. Like, how can somebody just shave you off a table? Like, what? I don't care how a senior you are. This is not something which is okay or acceptable, no matter who you are, and no matter how important this issue is to you right now. Um, like, you can do this in a different way. You can also just ask for an appointment with this person and meet them. Um, but what really mattered to me after being fe felt feeling horrible in this situation is that my actual conversation partner later on came to me um, and apologized for the situation and um, uh, was talking with me about the situation, how unacceptable it is. And um, this person also um, went some institutional ways to uh, file a complaint against this person and how, how he behaved in public. So this just meant so much to me that this very senior researcher didn't just overlook how I was treated in this situation, but actually offered direct support and was also talking op openly about it, even though he missed in a situation to actually interfere. Um, but this just meant a lot to me. And yeah, but I can't say that I have good strategies or good ways with dealing with these situations. Um, I don't know, how, how, how would you do this? But um, do you think if you were, say, a, a male PhD student, would you have, well, it's a difficult question because you're not, would you have shoved this uh, senior researcher who came barging in and said, hey, wait, I'm still in a conversation. Could you wait for a moment until I'm finished with my part? Do you think a guy would normally do that? Or do you think... It depends on the guy, uh, probably yes. not. <laughs> the situation was also very aggressive between these two, between these two silverbacks, so to say. <laughs> so it was not a situation where you would easily interfere. Um, but I'm, I also think that if I would have been um, maybe not uh, a five to blonde female, I probably would not have literally been shaved or sh shoved off the table. You know, it's like the situation, like I probably would have been more visible and was not just discarded from the situation. So I think it's also had a lot to do with me being junior, um, but I also think it has something to do with me being a woman. And um, I have not seen treated men like this before, but this is also my bias because I mainly, I am a woman and it's hard for me to, to be like this. Do you have? experiences like this? No, and I, I do think that this potentially, well, it seems to me subjectively this is more of a female problem, and, and it's horrible in yeah. that sense. I don't know. Uh, I had a similar situation happen when I was still a trainee. I was at a conference, and my PI was presenting a poster. I saw him in a, a poster session or something, and so I was, was talking to him, and kind of in the middle of our conversation, he just disengaged and saw somebody else, another senior researcher who he wanted to talk to. And so, you know, either kind of that person over, I can't quite remember, or kind of, but I do remember him kind of turning his back to me and kind of, okay, I found someone more more important to talk to. You're, I'm done with you. And yeah, that, he was, you know, my, my PI and my mentor. And so I didn't like being treated like that. And now in retrospect, I'm not, you know, I probably should have, stepped back in and you know introduced myself to this other person who had just come up and kind of used it as a networking opportunity maybe but in the moment i can't remember what i did i probably just walked away but it, it definitely gave the message of you're not worthy there's somebody more important here yeah yeah, yeah. and it's also i think it's not also i mean it's not only being female but it's also that as a female you're not usually you don't usually have the physical presence of a man so and if you are 
if you're tall and broad shouldered, you're much less easy shoved away. And also, I have the feeling like even even males which are younger than me and less senior, um, they are still like. I'm so often just treated as the student, <laughs> even though in this situation I'm technically the senior. Um, just because people assume, oh, short, female, probably young, probably a trainee. So they just tra treat me sometimes like like I'm an undergrad. And this is something which regularly happens. Or, um, yeah, I mean, I also don't think like the facility manager of my of our building here, when I say hello to him, sometimes says, hey, babe. I doubt this happens to my male colleagues. <laughs> and I also like, I know I should just go to him and like tell him this is not okay, but it's also always a very public situation where, and I'm often in a rush, I have to run to a meeting and this just happens and then they are in a group and then just me walking there and say, you know, this is kind of not cool. He's it's never said hey babe to me. <laughs> no? <laughs> so, I'm jealous. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but yeah. It's it's just really hard to get over yourself in your situation in this situation and get the courage together to actually do something about it. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, I probably will eventually. And uh, but it's just it's hard to do. And you also you don't want to expose or you're really upset in a situation and you don't want to be too emotional because this is not going to work for your favor. So. It's just very hard, like in terms of timing and also picking the right tone to say something. Yeah, yeah. but I mean, like I would say thinking retrospectively, um, I mean, I, I think I've also done like you guys, I have like moved away or something like that. But, but now I think I would just like exert myself. I would just stand there and say, well, I'm still here or like, can you wait a bit or, you know, just make them be aware of it. I, I, I think it helps. Like we have to, I mean, then what, what else is there? I don't know. <laughs> and don't take it personally. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So yes. what? Yes. Okay. Well, I'm here. So yes. yes. <laughs> yeah. So well, I just reminded me of uh, even guys have to take care of their physical appearance because some guys grow their beard just to look a bit more senior. So I, I do agree that physical appearance has a great impact. So then being aware that we are less noticeable just makes it's more important for us to step one step forward and say, we are here, listen to me, a bit more consciously than the other yeah, people yeah. because we have to to make level with the bigger, stronger, broader guys, I guess. Is it just about awareness of the situation? Like, I always hold myself back because I know, like, chances of being snarky are high <laughs> of course you also don't want like this person probably while it's not okay in this situation but the prob person probably didn't do this with a bad intent so just throwing this right into their face and attacking them on the spot is probably also not fair especially when it's a very public situation so i think you have to do it strategically it's not that you can hey shove off wouldn't work out. You have to be a bit more grown up to do that. But uh, I think there are ways to, like what Oscar said, that um, I haven't finished my question yet. Or can I continue with the conversation? Uh, can you give me a minute more because I haven't finished my um, part yet or something? You know, just to say to, um, yeah, to be visible, to not just um, step back and accept the situation that of being shoved out. I know it takes courage and um, some people do it naturally, some people cannot, but for the people who cannot do it naturally, just need to push themselves a little bit forward and speak out and make your presence visible. Yeah, but of course there's the other problem of this, whatever, the, the beachy woman. So if you also speak out, then um you know they're like oh she's a you know 
then then yeah. you look aggr you're labeled as aggressive or the problem maker or the you know so i mean it, it's really hard for women to find an identity that works i mean like we were discussing at the beginning you're either too motherly or you're too ex expressive like you're too like excited or emotional or something or i mean you're always labeled as something or you're too male I, I, it seems like people are always trying to put you into something to understand what wh why is she there why is she in this position or how, how did she get there was she doing this or doing that or doing this or you know they try to come up with these reasons for why you're doing what you're doing sometimes it's very tiring and you know you i always feel feel myself okay what what's the kind of personality now i should be adopting in this situation i'm always aware of myself yeah yeah, yeah or I, I always feel guilty i still feel guilty if i'm making a fuss in a meeting you know if i'm disagreeing with rest of the people i feel like oh my god probably they think because i'm a woman or something so i think i've kind of internalized this guilt feeling for speaking out so i i try to speak out because that's the personality I am, but I always feel guilty because I feel like I'm the woman doing this. Maybe I'm not allowed or I shouldn't. Always these thoughts are going in my head. Yeah, and it doesn't go away, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's hard to find to be the personality that you, what will it be? You're too authoritative, but as a woman, if you're too authoritative, that's also like, mm -hmm -hmm. Like, how dare you, you know, are you trying to be like a man or, yeah, it, it's very difficult. <laughs> yeah. very fine line. Very fine line. Non-respectable and being non-threatening. Yeah. I that guess that's the challenge, right, for us <laughs> to find out the good balance of being um, present, not too bitchy, not too authoritative, not too dominating, because women's favorable qualities are not those, but still being able to, um, yeah, be seen as an important person. I guess that's the difficulty that we have to challenge. Yeah. Yeah, I agree totally. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, so what's a message for young young researchers? What would it be? Um, well, if I have to go first, um, I mean, don't give up. You know, <laughs> so I mean, don't shy away. Uh, but I mean, accept that it will be difficult, right? I mean, I cannot say that it will be easy for anyone. It will be hard for everyone. It will be harder with a family. Um, but it doesn't mean that you should not have a family. Uh, but I, I think be strategic and yeah, put things on table. And if you don't feel comfortable or if you feel like you're not being treated fair just because you're a woman, just say it. But I mean, not in a confrontational way. I mean, find the way that suits you because there is no wonderful way because as a woman you're not supposed to do that right so anytime we do it it's already a challenge find your way that feels right to you um yeah but yeah i i think have this me meta cognition all the time like be meta don't take anything personally seriously just try to move strategically because i think that's what men do so yeah that's my advice what part of what part about you being aware and aware and strategic is also very important to take time off and uh, yeah to just disengage from this sometimes and really being able to focus on your work like as much as this awareness is constantly there it's also really important to get over this problem sometimes and just move forward and also just have your parts of your private life where you can just relax and disengage from this. Um, because like working harder does not only mean working harder, but also just using a lot of mental energy on these kind of things and worrying about this.
things. And uh, we don't have unlimited mental energy. So if you're a woman and you already have to put so much effort into these things, also just be very aware that this is tiresome and that you need a break once in a while. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> Trying to summarize this, I would say, going back to what I said before, so I think that a lot of us, or maybe every all of us, are struggling with very similar things, male and, and female and women. And talking about this and realizing that uh, some have found solutions or coping mechanisms, strategies, and some just just uh, by talking with people, making you know, realizing that that because it's so difficult because of all of this is just just having establishing support system by being able to talk about these things and finding ways with your uh, peers or your institutions and how to. Um, to manage the, this the issue of work-life balance, I don't think that exists. And but trying to really achieve that, uh, by I, I was given advice to protect what's important to you, and, and I think by putting this on the table openly and saying, it, right, my family is important to me, so I have time issues because I need to drop them off in schools and I can't uh, drive for a certain time. These are things that are important by being open and talking uh, because I think at the end of the day we experience a lot of the same challenges that, uh, or experienced in the past or in the future. Um, yeah. I would echo all of that and also say, yeah, think about think about what's important to you and prioritize those things and also set realistic expectations for yourself you know it's not realistic to try to get 10 grant applications in this year but you know one or two yes okay and so push the rest of them off until until the future so i think setting realistic expectations for yourself knowing very well what you yourself can do in your own situation is important and then not apologizing for it you know I've tried very hard to say, you know, when students ask, email me over the weekend and say, oh, can you look at this paper? You know, I don't say, oh, I'm sorry. No, I can't. I just say, no, <laughs> I cannot because it's Saturday night. Um, so I think not apologizing to others and to yourself as well, you know, not feeling guilty for taking the time to, to you know, provide yourself some wellness um, is important because it, you can often get consumed by the guilt otherwise. And Suku, do you want to say some last words? Well, I agree with what all of the things that, that has been said. Um, and I really do agree with what Emily just said. Um, do what you think is important and give that a priority. Um, sometimes this, you really get drowned in what's really important in your life as a whole, both work and private. Uh, I think that that is something you should never forget whenever making decisions because you can't have everything um, you have to select. And then if you think about what is important, then any kind of decisions that you come to, you will never regret. So, and uh, another thing I remembered is um, when you get a no from somebody, it's not a no rejection of you as a person. It's a no rejection to the request you made. So don't get too much absorbed and depressed for being rejected for something, even an article. It's a very nice, not a nice thing to get rejection always, but don't take that as a you're not a good, uh, good enough person. That's not the case. So I try to tell myself every time I get a no because then I get... I'm not afraid to say things. I don't avoid to say things because I'm afraid to get a no. That doesn't work. But if I think of myself, well, getting a no is not um, being, you know, I'm not a good person. It's sort of the, the thinking attitude. I think that might help to be a bit more um, expressive <laughs> and ask for requests. And, you know, you get no's every now and then, but if you're ready to get a no, then you can always go forward and ask for more things because you're not afraid. I think that's 
something that um, I keep trying to tell myself to do more. <laughs> That's a very important point is that, that not being afraid and just because you get to know just because you, you hit a lot of obstacles and you encounter a lot of problems, just not to get discouraged and just not giving up. Um, we all suffer for this and uh, we all have our motivations why we're doing this and why we think it's worth it. Um, and I think just sticking to it and doing what you believe in is a really important uh, part of uh, being not only successful in your career, but also being being accepting and fine with who you are as a person, what you stand for. Um, and I think this is just one of the most important things in life, that at the end of the day, the only person you have to live with for the rest of your life is yourself. So if you can't live with your image in a mirror or who you are as a person, then this is probably the worst failure in life you can po possibly encounter. So um, yeah, this was a very interesting and also very long session. So I think this was the longest academic crisis line we ever had. I thank you very, very much for your time and input. Um, I learned a lot today and it was a pleasure talking to you. Um, and I now switch off the live stream. I'm going to write a blog post. So you find the blog post on my website, um, probably tomorrow. Um, and uh, thank you very much all for listening and see you next time.